Hey gang. Hey there gang, welcome back to the big board. I've got a conversation here between myself and Bruno, who is uh, the designer of uh, Time for Trumpets from GMT Games. This particular interview was done in a fairly loud vocation. It's at the Game On uh, Gaming Conference. And it was during the lunch hour. And we're off in the corner, but you've still got a fair bit of background noise. So hopefully you can all hear quite well and you'll enjoy what you hear and be a little bit more informed about the, some of the design principles that went into building this game for all of us to play. So, Bruno, nice to meet you. Yes, sir. <laughs> what I wanted to do today was uh, have a conversation with you about your design philosophy fun stuff, right? get, get deep down in the weeds, but because of your maturity, <laughs> you have a lot of experience with game design, you've been around for a while, do you want to just share with everyone so they get some context around your game design history, so everyone knows who you are and what you've done? So, so what the reason I got into game design was... I liked Battle of the Vaults at right. 65 when, when there were only like six games to play. Yeah. And I sent uh, a, a treatise to Avalon Hill on how they should redo the game because it was so ahistorical. It was great fun. Right. But it was so uh, weakly done because they didn't have the research at that point. It hasn't been released. And Avalon Hill said, would you like Don Greenwood? Because we would like you to redo Battle of the Bulge. And so I redid Battle of the Bulge 81, trying to keep it along the flavor of the original Bulge 85, where it was a fun game and a, not a lot of work to play. And so we play tested it for a couple of years, and it was easy to play, and people had fun with it. And it was uh, other people came along, Randy Heller, and balanced it. Because I had it too historical. Right. And it was really hard for the Germans to win. So Randy balanced the game with scenarios that made it 50-50. So I learned a lesson from Randy. And uh, Bulge 81 became popular because it was easy to play and it was balanced. Right. It was sort of historical. Um, so more more, uh, more history there than the original. More history, yeah. But then by, by then, there's, there's more research coming out. So. Yeah. Okay. And then you also designed Bitter Woods, right? Uh, Bitter Woods was the eighth iteration of Bulge 81, essentially. Wow. Okay. So it had been, uh, let, let me rephrase that. Bitter Woods, first there was uh, Bulge 81. We had a second edition. Then we had a third edition. And then Randy, who worked with me on all three of those, Randy Haller, made a game uh, which was they made just a few hundred copies it was not too uh, not too bad of a game so that was the fourth edition and bitter woods became the fifth edition of Bulge 81 and randy was the main mover on that i just was the developer he right. took Bulge 81 and remade it into bitter woods right i got you okay okay but nobody would publish it so i had a gentleman's agreement with eric dodd who owned avalon hill to republish Bulge 81 when I wanted it republished. And so I told him I would like him to republish Bulge 81. He said no, which I <laughs> knew he was going to say. Because he'd already done it, a handful of editions, yeah. right? So um, he said, give me a new game instead. I said, okay, I got one. <laughs> Bitter Woods. Change the name. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Mark Simonich was the developer. So we put Bitter Woods out, extremely popular. And what year was that? Do you remember? 1995. Had uh, Tigers in the Mist come out then from Simonich? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Did that have any influence on the, the game design at all? Not at all. Not at all. And do you, uh, what? so just to pause for a second there, what do you, what do you think the uh, fascination is? You've told me a little bit about your family history with relatives that fought at the Bulge. Yeah. But what do you think the fascination is, is particularly for, it seems like, Americans in general, for fascinated with the bulge. Right? Well, it was the greatest battle in American history, the largest, most casualties, uh, most dramatic. Right. And uh, even Winston Churchill said it was the greatest battle in American history. So people who grew up in my time frame, right. they, they liked the battle of the bulge. Right. Right. And, and there was so much 
um, mystique about it. Uh, you know, the Germans are, they can't, they're, they're weak, they got nothing, and all of a sudden they come out of here with these big tanks and they're running over the soldiers. Right, and literally out of the, of the fog. world. Right, literally out of the fog. fog. Yeah. It's the end of the world. And uh, the Germans thought the Americans were going to be a pushover, and it turned out that even the Green Division, like the 99th, fought, they essentially fought to the death. So yeah. The Germans couldn't break through. Yeah. And so they had great mystique to it. But there's three battles that are this way. Uh, the Battle of Waterloo, the Battle of Gettysburg, and the Battle of the Bulge. There's at least, uh, uh, let me say, I'm not exaggerating, at least there's one game for every year that war gaming has been around for each of those battles. Right. Or probably more. Right. Right. So they have the greatest mystique, those three battles. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? And so uh, with, um, with Biddle Woods... That's gone through a couple of iterations as well. Yes. A couple of editions. And there's, you know, deluxe editions and super yes. designer deluxe editions. And yes. So very popular again. Very popular. So it's sold out every time. Sold out every time. It's minimal changes each time. So we try to keep it the same. Yet uh, here we are on the cusp of having another bowls design by you with a time for trumpets. Right. Four maps. A lot of counters. 2,300 counters. Hefty rule book. Right. It's actually not, not not too bad to read. Now that I understand your design, a little bit more about your design approach, and this is going to be great as we have this conversation with this sure. designer deep dive, but uh, really well structured with chart support and all that sort of good stuff. Why do we need to have another bulge game? So, um, well, I have all this information. Now, they asked me in 19, after Bulge 81 was published, John Devereaux and Danny Parker, who are Bulge fanatics like me, okay. said, Bruno, you got all this information. Why don't you do a battalion-level Bulge game? And that was John Devereaux. Danny referenced them on to me, and I said, John, you're crazy. I am not doing another Bulge game. That was in 1981 or two, right. after I just finished uh, Bulge 81 wasn't interested in making another game. Uh, games are work, making games are work. It's fun to see the when it works with other people and hopefully they, they're easy to understand. If the game's not easy to understand, then I don't want to make it. Mm -hmm. So a time for trumpets is bitter woods with a boatload of chrome. So it just needs to be easy to play, and and you know you've seen the mechanics. Yes, yes. For combat, it's the same thing over and over. The terrain is really simple. The modifiers, there's a basic two or three modifiers, so it's the same thing over and over. And then you throw the chrome in there, like like Mike pulled on you when he took Stablock. Yes. Right, that's a little chrome. Yes. So, yes. Much to my chagrin. Yes. And so I, that's one of the things that I think is interesting. One of while we're sitting here playing with you, we've got this uh, kind of narrative that's going on that you're sharing with us. And some of the stories, you know, the the the, the base, the false wall basement under the under the restaurant yes. the, where the alcohol and all the Americans found it, and, and so all that's written into the playbook. Yeah. So my design people say, are you going to do designers notes? No. They're all all the notes of what's happening with these units is written in the playbook. Right. This is why they didn't show, this is why they didn't drive right here. And this is why you can't do it in the game, et cetera. So I wrote the history into the order of battle. Right. I think the other thing that I found, find interesting here is that you have also looked at this not just as a, a great tribute to the history of the battle, but you're also, so yes, you're making it playable, but you're also looking at it from a war gamer's perspective where you're kind of, kind of prevent a lot of the gamey BS Definitely. that goes on Definitely, because we all as gamers we read the victory conditions and we look at the rules and go okay I'm going to go take Piper you yeah. know this way instead of that way yeah. or I'm going to swing first armor over here instead of making them go where they went historically because right. we know that the mud's going to turn up at a certain time or that something's going to happen so tell, tell me a little bit about that uh, like anti-war game the anti-war anti gamer rules right yeah. so you know it we, when we play tested uh, the first few times, I would recommend to the German player, okay, in history, the Germans did not know the 2nd Infantry Division was in the Monchau Forest. 
even though they were fighting uh, against the 272nd and 322nd, 326th Volks Grenadier for three days, the Germans, when they attacked on the 16th, had no idea the 2nd Infantry Division was in there because they took no prisoners for three days. Only the Americans took prisoners. So when the Germans finally ran into the 2nd Infantry Division, um, they went around them. And uh, the 2nd Infantry Division, which had just taken Weilerscheid Crossroads, uh, was loath to give it up because it's in, it was in a difficult place. It was the Siegfried Line, right. the West Wall. So the commander of the 1st Army refused permission for the 2nd Infantry Division to retreat. So the commander of the 2nd Infantry wasn't sure of the impact of the German attack. They haven't seen Piper yet. They don't run into him until the 17th when he's in their rear. But he has a plan in position just in case the Germans overreact to the American attempt to take the Roar River dams. He has an emergency plan and he implements it. He's not allowed to retreat, but he implements this plan. He holds the road with his units that are in reserve and when the Germans come up against the 99th and the 2nd at Rochereth and Prinkel, it's massive attrition. And so they actually get nowhere, but because of him implementing that plan, he got the Distinguished Service Cross because he saved the 2nd Division and the 99th from getting surrounded. Right. Piper, on the other hand, just bypassed them. He overran the weak units in the Losheim Gap, and when he could have taken a right turn and isolated all the 2nd Infantry and 99th, he held true to his mission, which was to go to the Meuse, so he turned to the southwest and didn't drive across the Warsh River. General Lauer was sitting up there, and he said all Piper had to do was turn right, and we were toast because we had nothing to defend him with. But the Germans didn't know that. Right. So I don't let the... There's a chance in the random events it gives Piper the it gives the German player the opportunity to isolate the second and the 99th. But if he doesn't roll that one chance at six, he has to keep true to the mission and go to the Meuse River. And so this is the prevent the war gamers from convoluting history because they can see everything. Yes, yes. Okay. And so, so you're helping. Uh, you're helping us experience the history. But keeping it, there's a ran, an element of randomness there so that, you know, there's a chance that that, because it could have, could have potentially happened. Yeah. And then you're also giving the, the player that choice. But otherwise, they're going to stick to a, a relatively historical timeline. Yes. Plus all the other random things that happen here. You've got weather and fog and dense fog and all these other things that can happen at different times that all come together to stitch a, a, a somewhat different tapestry together as we're seeing play out here. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. All right. So so you, when did you – so you kicked off the thinking and the planning on this almost after you first finished 81, Bowls yeah. 81. But I, I tabled it until uh, uh, 2004 Okay. when the – friends said, bro, you should make this battalion level game. You have all this information. Yeah. If you don't make it, you're just going to die and it's going to go to the grave with you. Well, that's encouraging. So we started <laughs> making it. Start, well, you know, war gamers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? You know we're going to talk this way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So um, so I started working on that. Started on the map. A little here, a little there. Uh, Joe, Joey Ass made the first two additions to the map. Then Mark took it over and simplified it. Because mm -hmm. Joe's maps are extremely detailed. Yes. I mean, he has, a, uh, I don't want to exaggerate. Joe, if there's a ditch along the side of the road, you can see it on Joe's map. It's, and it's amazing how he makes his maps. He, he showed me, he superimposes the uh, Google Earth over the 1 to 50,000 scale maps, and then somehow he turns it into a war game map. And I'm like, holy smoke, Joe, that's amazing. I, sh I said, Mark, did you ever see how Joe makes those maps? And Marcos, I taught him how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was funny. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I think Mark has a nice way of uh, 
giving you the feel of the detail without overwhelming you visually, yeah. you know? March games are fun to play. Yes, yes. Really, and, and, and he has a really good series. He has the, uh, I like uh, uh, Normandy 44. I like uh, Hitler, what's the name? I forget the name of the game, but I really like it because Hitler takes command. It's the one where they're invading the caucus. Oh, yes, yes, caucus campaign. Yeah, yeah I like yeah. that one. I haven't got to play Holland 44 yet, but if it's going to be the same as Normandy, it's going to be a good game, really yeah, good game. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. And but Mark works in the little history, too. Yes, yes. So the only game I didn't like of Mark's too much was uh, Ukraine 43. Right. It was too much trench warfare. Right? So, right. And you could win if you were, if you were uh, the Germans. You knew how to play the game. But I didn't get into Ukraine 43. It's a popular game, though. Right. Um, right. So Ukraine 43, that's a good, good comment. I, I, I've heard that the f- people like the first version more than the second yeah. version. I've got the second version. Haven't played that one yet. Played Holland 44. I thought that was quite good. Ardennes 44 did exactly what I expected it to me. Yeah, awesome. made me super frustrated as the uh, as, as the Americans and super frustrated as the Germans. Yeah, <laughs> but so, I really like the way Mark put roadblocks. Well, he had the concept of roadblocks mm-hmm. and time on target. Yes. So I have to put that in this game. Right. Right. And I have. Right. Yeah, and also I think yeah, your artillery parks and the artillery rules are pretty interesting. But okay, so let, let's stay on track here a little bit with the history of your design because some of the stuff you were telling me last night about you know the, the you built two full playtest copies and it's been played to, under playtest for several years now, and you've got a crew of five guys who know the rules well enough and have gone through iterations with you. And then you're doing things like now with us, where we're basically doing some fine-tuning right. playtesting fine-tuning. and seeing if we can break, not, not break the game, but do something a little out of the box. It's always good to get people who aren't familiar with the game right. because they're going to find stuff that you don't see because you're right. too familiar with it. Right, right, right. You've been living it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you built a couple of copies of this, and you, should, and you had some help with the maps, but... What, what about the O? I mean, the OB. Everyone, everyone gets sycophantic and crazy about the OB and uh, obsessed with yes. with the well. You know, there the, were these one tank destroyer was here, and so where did you draw the line at the battalion scale to say, okay, enough's enough, or this is what what happened? What drove you? Playability or okay. reality? Or so w- with a battalion level game, in order to not have it become a trench warfare game, you're going to have to write rules so that the Germans can get through all the units. Because when we make a game from a logistical standpoint, it's twice as wide as a regimental level game. But the number of American units increases by five. So you double the width, but you increase the number of units by five. It's not going to work. Unless you write the rules so that there is fluidity mm. and there also has to be some rigidity, otherwise it's too much stress when you're the defender. So I built both into the game with the fog rules. And if you read the historical accounts, you will see hundreds of times the guys are the Americans are going here and they run into the Germans. They didn't see him, or, and vice versa. Or the Germans will t- be driving down a road, and there'll be another column of tanks, and they'll just merge into that column of tanks, and that'll be American tanks, German tanks, riding together because they don't realize they're the other side. This happened numerous times. And that's the fog rules built into the fog of war of this game. So, so that gives you fluidity, and how did you layer in rigidity? Uh, there's a clear you're going to have clear turns so the fog usually burned off by the early afternoon so on the pre-dawn turns and the morning turns there's a chance of fog and 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 it's, it's sometimes sometimes there were clear clear space clear times where the air wasn't so foggy and uh, so I don't make it 100% chance of fog on all the on the 
pre-dawn and morning turn, 67% chance. So that way, it was an unknown situation for those guys in 1944, so I want it to be unknown when we play it. Right. You don't know what's going to happen. And, and, and that's the same thing for, that I did for the mud. In, in Bitter Woods, which is a great game, you know that when you're the Americans, you can rely on the fact that on the 18th, the ground's going to turn to mud. Well, they really didn't know that then. So the Germans were hoping that it was going to get colder, but they didn't have the weather. They didn't know as much about the weather as the Americans did because the weather, the prevailing weather, comes in from the northwest. So the Americans know what's coming, oh, it's coming. better yeah. than the Germans. Right. And uh, so we had to have unknown in the weather. So I did have to show that to Mark, that the weather wasn't the same everywhere in the Ardennes. You had uh, the Schnee Eiffel when it was foggy and misty. In other places, it was snowing there. And you had the Hoven, which is a uh, swamp, mm -hmm. elevated swamp. And then in Luxembourg, you have Little Switzerland, which is a snowy area. So we, we broke it up into, to make it simple, into the three Panzer Army, the three Army areas. So the weather can be different for the north, the weather can be different for the center, and the weather can be different in the south. Three different areas. Which I find fascinating. Uh, it really it really changes the, the dynamic of the game. And, and as a multiplayer game, it, it's great because one, one guy's dealing with fog, the other guy's got snow, <laughs> yeah. you know, or dense fog, or it's clear. So that's pretty cool. So the, o, the OB... And the and the maps were obviously a labor of love that probably took quite a while to kind of evolve. So the maps we make them from about thirty-two one to fifty thousand scale maps. And so what I did is I get an acrylic and I blow up I had the maps electronically all of them. So I blow them up so that a one mile hex is is a three inch hexagon that I have in my acrylic. And I blow it up and I put that three inch hexagon on there and I just look to see what the terrain is and then I judge it from that what the terrain should be for the hex on the map. So that's how we made the 7,000 hexes. That's why it took so long. <laughs> so, so would it be fair to say that you have a decent level of attention to detail? Yes. Well, I'm an engineer. Right. So engineers are, are anal. Yeah. That you know, that's just they're conservative. They're they want everything to sort of work out. You know, you don't want it to be fifty fifty because then you can't sleep at night. What should I do? Should I make that forest or should I make it woods? You would rather have it to be seventy five percent so I don't have to make the decision. <laughs> so, so Mark and I argued over that. He's really knowledgeable. So Mark and I argued over approximately a hundred hexes. Out of the 7,000. Out of the 7,000. Interesting. And what it wound up being is if I won my point on hex A or hex 1, Mark had to won, win on hex 2 or we would have an impasse. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, next time I talk to Mark, I'm going to have to give him a hard time about giving you a hard time. <laughs> yeah, it was fine. We, we laughed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I bet, I bet you did. So are you both are you both sitting there? Uh, are you doing this over the phone and then both looking on a PC screen and going, "Oh no, that's woods. No, it's not. It's, it's forest." <laughs> it's most it's mostly emails. Emails, oh, okay. And face to face. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So it's it's um it's really nice to have people like this that know this stuff. It's mm. uh, we can really right because he's been there several times and yeah. you've been there several times, right? That's fascinating. Now, so you. So once you got through the sort of the design ideas around map and counters and all the rest of it, you you had a the order did, of battle. Order of battle, right? Did you have a predisposition in terms of gameplay style that you wanted it to be more or less like, say, bit of woods? Like or you wanted to be more like bit of woods, it's, but it's a fun game. It's fun. Fun, right? Right. And it has a good allusion to history. Okay. So we want it to be that way. And how, how much of the... So if you're a Bitter Woods player, if someone's listening here and they're a Bitter Woods player, they're going to feel like they could probably pick this system up relatively easily. One but turn. One turn. Well, like that chap that was playing with us earlier on. Yeah, yeah he picked it up in one turn. Yeah. Uh, so 
what we're adding here there's, there's a lot of chrome a lot of chrome and a lot of the chrome's fun too yeah. it seems because I, I mean there's been a lot of laughing and high-fiving going on as we're playing this yeah so when you when you started building out the rules uh, this is probably the biggest game you've designed and probably the longest rule book you've written oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah because Battle of the Bones is only like what, 16 pages of rules yeah. so the rules here are uh, large print, 50, 52 pages of rules. Your um, like your background uh, with testing all the the Bradleys and the AFVs and everything like that. Have you ever thought about designing a modern war game? Yes, I'm, I'm I'm more I'm more into the historical stuff. I like the, the yeah. historical stuff. If you ever do another game, what what's it gonna? What do you think you want to do? Uh, I already got one that's 90% done. It's the uh, uh, Battles of the American Revolution small unit actions, a thousand men or less. Oh, wow. And uh, <gasps> GMT said they would print that when I already showed it to them. But they wanted four titles, and I only had one. So until I finish this one, I can't redo that. I can't work on that when they come up with three more titles. Right. And so what? So what would that include? What would uh, what 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 battles would you think you would want to cover there? So I did cow skirmishes, cow pants, right? So that was the one that I showed him. So I took Battle of the American Revolution, which is uh, two hundred fifty two hundred fifty yards per hex, and the. Uh, if I use that scale for the small for cow pens and the size of the units, each side would have two units. It wouldn't work too fast. So I, I increased the size of this by six. So, so it's like fifty meter hexes? It's twenty five yards. Twenty five yards. Oh it would be meters in England. Right. It's twenty five yards per hex. And that worked out well. I had to toy with it to get it to work so that the scale would, would transfer based on the size of the units. So they're company size units instead of uh, regimental. And they're usually about a hundred guys if they're full strength. In a, in a 25 yard hex they all line up in three rows. So that's kind of cool though. I don't know that I've seen a game at that scale in that period. I'm sure there's, they're out there somewhere. But it plays just like uh, Battles of the American Revolution. Yeah, which is great just system. Like Do you use the tactical chits and stuff like that? Absolutely. Yeah. So reconvening after lunch. We we're going to jump in and talk about rules, but I think we want to talk a little bit more about the OB, right? Order of Battle? So um, there's a few people that can probably talk on the level that we talk on detail of order battle. That would be Joe Yast and John Devereux. So the three of us are known as the extreme geeks of uh, Ball's Order okay. and the minutia. And uh, John Devereux has his library is immense. And he, he likes to talk about it. How his, his wife has no idea how many books he has <laughs> or how much they cost. Really? Right, so, right. Um, John is um, probably the foremost expert on order battle. When we decided to add, add the uh, <coughs> anti aircraft, we finished a playtest session at Consum Expo. I said, John, we're going to add the anti aircraft. Well, he didn't have anything on anti aircraft, and I had only a little bit. So for the next year, we managed to collect the unit histories for every anti-aircraft battalion that was in the bulge except five. Oh, wow. And then we were able to come up with an order of battle for anti-aircraft. And they weren't just used for anti-aircraft. Both sides used them as ground Right, ground support, ground elements, yeah. yeah. Which kind of leads me to another question. <clears throat> this is the probably the most robust air system and set of rules that I've seen for a bulge game. Usually it's highly abstracted. <clears throat> That's not the case here, is it? Right. Um, if we're going to make a battalion-level game and 
the, the mystique is how the U.S., the Germans had to attack when the Americans did not have air superiority. And the only way they could do that is to attack when the planes couldn't fly. So if it wasn't that important, they wouldn't have scheduled it that way. Right. And the history, the mystique is how American air power, when the weather cleared, the American air power just kicked the Germans all over the place. So we wanted to get that feel built into the game. And the, the, when I first put these air rules out, they were more complex. But it would take an hour to go through the air sequence, and the play testers didn't like that, so we cut it down to where it was, we could do it in five minutes. Right. And it but, but, you're still get, but you're still getting some different aircraft types and different mission capabilities and things like that, right? So originally, being uh, meticulous, we had 20 different kinds of airplanes. Okay, well, that got to be unwieldy. So we, we made it to the most likely that were over the bulge. You won't see any Mustangs because they weren't. They weren't performing ground support or anything over the bulge. They were escorting fight uh, bombers. Right. So the main, about 67% or 70% of all the American sorties were P, P-47s. There's a little bit of P-38s. We didn't put those in. And uh, we wanted to have bombers in. So the ones that were used the most, there's a half a dozen different kinds. But the one that were used the most was the B-26 with... 1150 caliber machine guns and a boatload of bombs that they converted to use for ground support. So we got P-47s and B-26s for the uh, Americans. The Germans predominantly had Focke Wolf 190s. Right. Um, for the bomber, we used the most used. There weren't a lot of them, but it was the Junkers 88. There were no Stukas. There were a minuscule amount of Stukas. Right. At that point, they were death traps. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to have fun, so we put in ME-262s. There were only about only about 3% of the sorties over the battlefield were ME-262s, but that was close enough for government work. <laughs> that, that lets you get one in there, right? Let's just get one in there. So with the with the OB and the, your your friend's assistance, so the game's kind of ballooned up in size then, right? With the, the counter density, did that impact? Did that start to impact rule design, or did you know that that's how that was going to happen, or what was the, what's the situation? So how did that impact? Question was, how does that impact the uh, well, we actually rule design at OB? What what came first? What came second? What impacted what? So the um, battalion level, we knew there was going to be a couple of thousand counters already. Right. From based on the original Vakar mine in 1977. Okay. So we have chopped out hundreds of counters uh, based on uh, for Mark recommended that we not use the uh, 10th SS and 11th Panzer divisions. They were going to be the third wave. And they weren't going to come in until the Germans crossed the Meuse. So Mark recommended, Bruno, when the Germans crossed the Meuse, call it an automatic victory, and we don't have to, we don't have to put <laughs> another hundred counters in there, which right. is true. Right, right. So we got rid of those two Panzer divisions. And um, in a lot of games that are regimental, if some of the division makes it in, you sort of got to let them appear in the game. Well, we were able to throw out other divisions that only had minuscule elements make it onto the battlefield by the 26th. So this is a battalion level game. If only a battalion or two made it on out of 20, we didn't include it. Right. So the 35th Infantry came for the Americans that came and sat around for three days before they committed. So we used it. We kept it in, but we used it as a, a random event. In case it's really bad, the Americans would have committed. Right. 
And uh, we don't put the 83rd Infantry in because they got there too late. So we were able to get rid of a few hundred counters based on decisions like that. We still have 2,300 counters. Now, when, uh, when you look at rule riding, right, what's your philosophy around that? Are you a terse rider or a voluminous rider or a narrative rider? What's your... Not narrative. Not narrative. No. So a narrative writer leaves too much for interpretation. So if you look at how the rules are written... And I, and, and I brought my experience from writing manuals for soldiers. The recommendation for that is try to limit your concepts to one sentence. So although war gamers are 99th percentile in intelligence on the wor- in the world, I just said, well, if if it works for a soldier who's not well trained or, or college educated, it's going to be really easy for a war gamer. So, if you look at the rules, you see almost all the rules are one sentence long. Right. And then there's a lot of bullet points that go with those, but it's kind of like a checklist. So, yeah. as you become familiar, you won't need to reference those as much. Detail. Okay. So, that's interesting. And then uh, <clears throat> one of the things that, and that I haven't really experienced too much of yet in the game is the command infrastructure. How important is that to the to the game, and what does it touch and influence? So, this is um, they act. Joe Polkowski put this in Vatemrine in 1977. It keeps the divisions together. So, it's unrealistic, you know, for you to factor count and send a division from the north into the center, so you can get enough factors to. Right get an optimal attack so the the units in a division have to ma- maintain their cohesion by staying within the command range of the de- of the division that keeps the divisions together the way they were right and um, to make it easier I color coded them so you can tell from a distance oh yeah that's there's the SS guys there you can see them or if you look at the uh, uh, Lair and Second Panzer, you can tell with their orange colors that, okay, that is the XLV-11 core. You can see it from a distance. So you can see, you can tell immediately if your guys are out of command, if you're too far away. So you have these little juggernauts of yeah, color. Yeah, And it makes it easier, color coding makes it easier to keep track. Right. And... So that's interesting because there are some game designers that uh, eschew color coding of divisions based on, especially at this scale, because there's too many, not enough colors in the rainbow. You're wrong. God did not make enough colors. God did not make enough colors? No. So we, we've, we've hit shades? We're, so we, as a result, we have green. The LXX X core is a light green. Yes. They will never, ever get adjacent to the XLV-1 core, which is dark green, because there aren't enough colors, right? So we have two <laughs> green cores. They'll never get next to each other. And then we have a couple of blue cores. Right. Notice they'll that. never get next to each other. Right. But people still confuse them. But, you know, there just aren't enough prime right. colors to right. use. Right, right. Yeah, so I guess that's when you got to resort to color bars and checks and boxes or whatever it may be right interesting okay so now on the uh so we talked about map counters ob rule development some play testing tell me a little bit more about the the, the play testing are you testing by scenario or is every time a campaign or what, what or are you doing both what what ha, what has happened in the play testing cycle we've and what te- works best for you right well we've tested uh, uh, when we do the week-long play test at cons and expo we've always done the campaign into the 20s but i note how things go so i can base the scenario victory conditions on the flow of how we play right. these long Right. And so the scenarios, of course, are easier to play because you don't have many as many units, and you have 
the objectives are easier to attain. Right. So we base the uh, scenarios, the victor conditions on the scenarios, based on the flow of the game when we play the campaign. And uh, so we've tested it both ways, as campaigns and also as scenarios. Interesting. And if we, and when the when the game actually comes out, scenario wise, uh, are there a, a, a hand, are there enough one mapper, two mapper type of things, or is everything going to require four maps? And... Um, Hang on one sec. We could start. Jess told us to start at any time. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So I have a, a, a one mapper of the six Panzer Army. But some people think I should change it to two mapper, so maybe I'll make, I think I'll make one of each. One mapper and a two mapper. Right. And uh, the, if you're going to play the fifth Panzer Army, it takes two maps because it bleeds over. Mm -hmm. And the seventh army is one map. So, and you might need to add one later. But there's uh, simple scenarios, like I have two introductory scenarios that are only one core. And uh, most people don't like them. They're too simple after they play a little bit. So I have an introductory scenario for the seventh army. And it makes it easy. It's easy because it doesn't have a lot of crow. And it teaches the mechanics, and then you can... Play and the other start, games and, and you can start layering in the chrome. Yeah, yeah but exactly. I mean, the chrome's where the game's at. So that's one of the interesting things about game design. I see a lot of games come out that have these introductory scenarios, and you play them, and sometimes you walk away going, eh, well, that was okay. I'm probably going to just move on to the next shiny thing. I often just start, the more and more I am back into wargaming now, after, I've been mean, back for a decade now, but back into it, the more I like to just kind of jump in and work it out and, and, if, and if there's enough chrome in there that's kind of going to grab me in a good way then I'm going to dig in and kind of reset it and try again so it's interesting I know you people want those step-by-step -step instructions but for me I, I want to I want to be gripped by what's cool and what's cool in this is the chrome Otherwise, I should just go play Bitter Woods or Art M44. No dis disservice to them, but uh, here we're getting a really deep, deep, deep. Seems like a really deep, rich experience. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you hope so, right? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Well, was there um, was there anything else you wanted to add about that week that I didn't touch on in terms of your design philosophy and approach? To um, this? Just that a lot of folks. Have put their knowledge into the game, right? So, and uh, they've added a lot of things, and I, I'm happy to have people find things wrong so we can correct them before it's printed. Right. And the last couple play tests uh, are with people that have not been familiar with the game, and they have little improvements mm -hmm. that are mainly on components and. Things like that, but n not nothing on the rules. Right. So we have, we, we think we've covered all the the problems in the rules, if there were. Any. Right. So you've got a pretty firmly baked, by the looks of it, from what I've read anyway, and experienced. Um, well, cool. Well, so thank you for doing that, and uh, I uh, hope we're going to we going to get this out this year. Yeah, they. It would have been out in December if I could have gotten the playbook done, but it'll be done within the next three months. Three months. <coughs> so then production run and all the rest of it. So it might come, might be here in the fall. Might be here in time for the bulge. 2019. Yeah, it was definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Thanks. Thanks.